So let me introduce uh, the, the, the folks that we have answering your questions. And I'm just going to go from left to right. Pierre Dangenou is our Vice President for Stakeholder Engagement for Africa. Fadi Shahadi, our CEO and President. Dr. Stephen Crocker, our Chairman of the Board. And Nick Quainer, who is very well known to most folks who cover the industry here in Africa, often re referred to as the father of the internet in Africa. A recent inductee into the Internet Hall of Fame, Steve Crocker. Was it last year, Steve, when you were inducted into the Hall of Fame? So you have two inductees here. Um, and uh, we were basically ready to take questions, but before that, do either of you, any of you gentlemen have an opening statement for these folks? Well, uh, first of all, we are delighted to be on this uh, extremely welcoming continent. I called it this morning, um, as many of our colleagues do, a hopeful continent. Africa uh, is right now driving the economic growth of, this con of, the, of the world. The fastest growing continent in GDP today, Africa. Um, all the indicators for this continent are superb. There is no better time for ICANN to be in Africa. Uh, also, it's a time where the internet is showing that it is an engine of growth for developed and developing economies. And Africa has both. So this is a place where the internet has incredible meaningfulness. Having said that, Africa still has a journey ahead to embrace and leverage the internet. Only one out of six Africans have access today. We have a long way to go. But all the trends uh, are positive, and we're extremely grateful uh, to be here uh, and to present ICANN to the African community. Um, very quickly, ICANN is um, here because uh, it's our normal, uh, regular meeting every trimester. But we are also here because we have launched in the last few months uh, a very focused strategy to grow our community in Africa and to support the needs of our stakeholders across Africa. We brought leadership on the ground here in Africa in Pierre D'Angenou, who's sitting to my right. And Pierre has now been empowered with resources and support from all of our community to actually bring about a very, very important set of activities now, these activities were not thought of or decided or discussed in some room very far away from Africa. Absolutely not. Africa itself, with the help of Pierre and many of our friends here, has come together for the last few months and developed a bottom-up strategy for how to empower our African stakeholders. And that bottom-up strategy was really from the stakeholders, not from ICANN. This is the African strategy. We are here to make it happen. We're delighted to be here. Thank you for welcoming us to your great homeland here in South Africa and to this great continent. Thank you, Fadi. Remy, you had a question? Can you identify yourself also, Remy, please? All right, thank you. Hello, good day, everyone. My name is Remy Nweke. I work for Digital Sense Business News, based in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, first of all, I have to start by uh, congratulating uh, the CEO of ICANN and his team, the chairman as well, um, as well our own uh, uh, father of internet. I'm glad that um, this is happening in our own lifetime. Uh, one of the key things I have previously discussed with the, uh, the former CEO of ICANN was when are we going to start feeling ICANN's presence in Africa. So I'm happy that Pierre has been brought in as a, a knowledgeable person in Africa to drive that. So now I congratulate all of you for being part of this process. And uh, my question now goes to first our own father of the internet, Dr. Ni. Um, now, you have been in the forefront of driving this dream. Now that it's coming to reality, what else are we expecting of you? What should be the next step? 
for those of us who are monitoring the scene from Africa, and to Dr. Crocker, you have been on this saddle. And uh, with the kind of president you have now in ICANN, what should we expect more from your team? And uh, probably, lastly, to Pierre, you are the engine man now. Africa depends a lot on you to show the world that we can deliver. That it's not only when we brought an expatriate somewhere else that something good can happen to us. Your dream, sir. Share it with us. Thank you. Uh, as, uh, as Fadi said, um, Africa is where it's happening. It's a tremendous growth, tremendous activity. So the dreams can actually be pretty big for Africa. Um, bringing the dreams down to earth uh, in, in some respects means focusing on the details of building strength in each country for each of the uh, country code top level domains and more broadly uh, working with the rest of the internet ecosystem, the uh, internet society, the network startup resources center, uh, the uh, RIRs, the ISPs and so forth to develop a good capacity, network exchanges, uh, higher bandwidth, accessibility for everybody. This is the, the, the sort of the, the nuts and bolts of making things work. And um, uh, it's, it, as, as is true in every part of the world, including even the so-called developed parts of the world, there's uh, a substantial amount of work to do to bring uh, network accessibility and service uh, to, available to everybody, and uh, the domain name system is obviously a piece of that, uh, as is the addressing and the routing and everything. Uh, so uh, what uh, I think of is uh, having, uh, th there's, a, there's several points across the continent where there are uh, real peaks of excellence, where there's uh, deep knowledge, uh, uh, network pioneers who have been working for years, uh, communities that have developed. And what we want to see, I think everybody wants to see, is instead of mentally thinking of a map that's got a few points on it, is to see a map that is kind of colored in uh, uniformly or nearly uniformly with uh, excellence of uh, services, knowledge, understanding, and all of the impact that that has on the economy, on the culture, on society throughout the, the whole continent. So that's in, in kind of broad terms. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it is indeed true that the internet has arrived. Uh, but it's only arrived, in my opinion. Uh, we only have the connectivity part, uh, meaning we have cables on our coast, but we still have work to do in spreading low latency, high bandwidth connectivity inland. Uh, we still have a challenge to uh, create the human capacity that is required to support these networks. And remember, these networks are growing also very fast, and so you need to be producing the skill sets required equally quickly, and we have a challenge of how to scale that. Uh, at the same time, we sometimes have you know, challenges regarding the policy environment. Uh, many of the countries do need to indeed adopt internet as a separate thing, uh, not necessarily pure telecommunications per se. We need to understand internet as internet and begin to put it in its rightful place in policy regulation, education, and so forth, uh, you know, we also need to adopt the internet properly within the society as a whole and begin to depend on it as a safe place to do various things we want to do, uh, from doing the banking things, e-commerce things, all the way to, through education, to entertainment, and so on. So w we've got it, but we now should be challenged to build the industries around it that will allow us to in some sense, get the benefits of uh, and improve the economy uh, you know, using that. Thank you. I had a question from um, uh, Remy about um, 
Well, saying that uh, Africa now depends on me, uh, of course, because we do have this uh, Africa strategy. I also wanted to know what could be my dreams, you know, for Africa. Um, well, uh, yes, this can be said as a kind of new season for Africa. Um, CEO Fadi says a new season that I can, and I always say that this new season transpired in Africa into a tool, a tool that we do have now, which is this strategy. At least it's lined up what we should be doing. And this is coming from, uh, I would say, um, uh, requests or eventually that people really need those things. And then they are saying that's what we need. So ICANN is just here to assist in some point. And ICANN is going to be the only one to do it. We insist, uh, we insist on partnership, you know, around this thing. Uh, but I would like to say that um, not just, it will not depend on me only. Um, I'm seeing this as um, a tool where we, at least in Africa, should also be uh, forging some sort of you know, partnership within Africa to really move this thing forward. Because ultimately, uh, this strategy is all about capacity development. And basically also is about, you know, uh, making Africa, you know, a real market. This thing. Fadi said it, you know, economic growth, we are seeing this at some point, you know, Africa is. But we need to deepen this thing. And when you come to digital economy, some of our countries are not really taking, you know, the appropriate measures to make this really happen, meaning they are not investing that much on the people. You see, the younger generation, they rely on this, for instance, to create you know, some jobs. What are we doing on this? We do have a, f a few I-hubs, you know, here and there in Africa. We need more of that. What are we doing in terms of, you know, incubators, you know, to really help, you know, those younger generation do those things? Uh, I really believe that we need to deepen the partnership with, you know, different, you know, um, I would say um, people, you know, or, or communities. For instance, the government, you know, you know, in Africa need to be convinced that some of those, those things should not just happen or come from outside of Africa. Uh, how are we really using the private sector in Africa to do a few things? For instance, content generation, content creation. Uh, Ni said it, we are having so many cable now, you know, surrounding Africa. So this is not going to be the issue. The issue is going to be um, what are the contents that you yeah. are, what are the applications? It's happening in a few places in Africa. We would like to be seeing this happening in most places where we are using those tools to really solve local problems. And uh, we definitely understand that. Those who can do it is uh, the Africans themselves. Uh, yes. And the rest can just support Africans. And I think that's what ICANN is here to do. We've got Kevin Murphy from DomainInsight.com in London on the phone with a question. Kev? Yeah, so this morning um, I can sign the registry contract um, the applicant for the Chinese um, version of .game. Um, now, that isn't subject to GAT advice, but the, the English language versions of game and games are subject to GAT advice and uh, therefore currently uh, on hold, and they can't sign contracts with that I can yet. Um, and it, it struck me that there might be a, a fairness problem here, because um, the GAC said uh, in Beijing, and they said again at the weekend, that um, the list of strings that they're concerned about is um, non-exhaustive, uh, non and we were talking yesterday about adding more strings to it. And it, it doesn't seem obviously what happens if you, you sign a contract with the registry and then the gap subsequently adds them to the, the, the list of, of worrying TLDs. So I, I guess my question is, wouldn't it be fairer to either freeze all the applications or none of them in order to um, kind of level the playing field here? Or, and also if you could address what the actual process is for if the gap suddenly says, oh, gee, we forgot to add Chinese.game to, um, to our Category 1 list, and we add it now. Thanks. Well, thank you, Kevin, for the question. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry because the quality of the audio was just enough so I can get a good, uh, a good part of it, but not all of it. But uh, I think what you're asking is specifically how would we deal with uh, advice that uh, the GAC, our governmental advisory committee, would provide uh, possibly after maybe we've signed contracts uh, with, uh, with registries. Uh, so I think all I can say about this, as, as I'm, I'm sure you know, Kevin, is uh, I cannot 
clearly speculate on what advice and if we will get any advice. And <coughs> when we do get advice, uh, we will address it. I think we have the mechanisms right now in the new registry contract and some of the, uh, the legal frameworks we built around that that allow us to deal with eventualities of change. Um, but again, I cannot right now um, speculate on what staff or board might decide depending on advice we haven't received yet. Uh, but as you know, I mean, well, you, thanks, you, thanks. sorry. Can I just follow up on that, sorry. I mean, I'm talking about advice you already have received. Um, the Beijing communique had a list and said it was non-exhaustive. They're treating it, it seems, right now like it is exhaustive. Um, so I, I'm wondering why the discrepancy. Um, yeah, again, I'm, yeah, the advice that was received uh, was addressed in our responses, public responses to that. I don't think I want to comment any further on this today. Uh, we are continuing uh, uh, work with the GAC on some of the parts of their advice as we speak. Um, so some of this is still in motion. Uh, but as I said uh, when we met last time in Beijing, ICANN is going to have to move forward with this program carefully, thoughtfully, but also in an agile way, which means uh, we might take some advice, address it, uh, move forward with some parts of the program, and adjust as we go forward. This way, we are functioning as our community expects us to, with care, but also with agility and speed, uh, always measured by the needs of listening to the community and ensuring the security and stability of the Internet. That we are not going to compromise on. Rebecca from uh, IDG. Uh, my question is regarding the infrastructure, the L route uh, program that you have with Afrinic. I wonder how far it has gone in terms of spreading across the different countries. And uh, the multi-stakeholder model that you keep talking about, keep uh, spreading the word, the word about, it seems to be not be taking root per se in Africa and many CCTLDs, Kenya being one of them, are looking more to go the traditional telecoms way in terms of managing the .ke domain. I wonder whether you have anything to do to say about that? People tend to go towards things they're used to do. But as you heard today, uh, the commissioner speak, as well as the secretary general of the ITU speak at our opening. He said the ways that we manage things in the past may not be the ways to manage things moving forward. This is from the Secretary General of ITU himself, Dr. Touré. And he's right. Uh, Hamadoun is right. That we must evolve and work together to discover the right models to manage different resources. Uh, more than 100 years ago, when the ITU was formed to manage the telegraph and then later telecommunications, it was absolutely the right model to do that, and today it continues to be the right place for telecommunications to continue growing its important global agenda. And the Secretary today spoke eloquently about the need to increase access in Africa, and this is clearly an area he put a lot of focus and a lot of work on and continues to. And we support him and deeply respect the work of the ITU in that area. Having said that, the Internet is a different resource. No one country, no one organization, no matter how powerful it is, could actually manage and run the internet, including ICANN, by the way. So no one. It, it, it is a resource that requires a multi-stakeholder approach. Now, whether everyone got that yet, that's a different story, but they will, because those who get into managing the internet very quickly realize that Unless we all come together, businesses, academics, technical people, governments, international organizations, we are not able to manage this great resource. I'll give you one small example. Today, you saw an African registrar, a French registrar, a Canadian registrar, an American registrar, all stand up and sign one agreement 
the same exact agreement, hundreds, over a thousand registrars in the world will now be accredited and governed by one agreement that ensures that the registrant and user rights are maintained. What government can do that? What international organization can do that? We are only able to do that because multiple stakeholders, including the contracted parties, worked together for years and came up with a formula that enabled us in one negotiation to have one agreement for all these uh, registrars across tens of countries to sign a legal binding agreement that ensures the public interest and the registrant and the users are assisted. So uh, to close on this point, I think that quite the opposite. We're seeing actually many governments move towards a multi-stakeholder model. Uh, Brazil uh, has shown leadership with CGI.br in Latin America. And I believe that very soon here in Africa, we'll see actually the tide towards multi-stakeholder uh, governance at a national level grow. And linking that into our transnational multi-stakeholder policies will also be in place. And it is growing. We have a lot of information that shows that governments are moving more in that direction than the other way right now. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, on your question on the El route, I can only uh, show you that uh, things are happening actually in Africa. Um, I think as of today, we can count uh, eight countries that are actually hosting those El routes, and uh, we have planned to improve uh, this. Um, we are also working with Afrinic. Uh, there was uh, an MOU on that. And the um, uh, decision has been taken actually to heavily involve, you know, the um, regional managers or regional uh, VP, uh, VPs. So definitely we are working with, uh, with Afrinic. Uh, procedures are in place. So what needs to be done maybe is to um, inform, you know, countries on those procedures and also uh, have them come up with, you know, their own uh, desire to actually host you know, those uh, routes, but it's happening. At least the one that uh, ICANN is in charge of. I mean, we have a very good uh, dissemination so far in Africa. Yes. So yes. Uh, I think it's, it's happening. It just depends on country that will come forward and then uh, abide by the, some of the procedures and have the appropriate, you know, um, equipment in place. And the rest is uh, will be easily done uh, by ICANN and uh, Africanic in collaboration. Thank you. We've, we've got one question that just came in, uh, and this is a two-parter, Fadi. Uh, to you, first of all, can you talk about specifically the ICANN strategy panel that you appointed Dr. Quainer to chair? And secondly, Dr. Quainer, would you talk about what you envision for that panel? Uh, this I'm delighted to talk about because um, for a long time, especially uh, the last few months, as we saw the role of ICANN uh, become clearer in different parts of the world, it became evident that we need to have a conversation as a community on the public responsibility framework of ICANN. And so uh, before we venture into what are we going to do to support and uh, uh, grow and extend our capabilities to enable our stakeholders around the world to achieve their goals. We said we need a framework. We need clarity on what is it we need to be doing and how we need to be doing it. I went around in the community and I asked, okay, I'm ready to form a strategy panel to discuss that. Who should lead it? Who should chair it? And the only name, frankly, that kept coming back to me from different parts of the world was uh, your own Nick Quainor's name. Uh, and when I reached him if not too long ago, just a, a couple of weeks ago, to ask if he would uh, agree to come help us do that, uh, I was delighted by his willingness. Uh, I was delighted by his deep understanding of how important this is, not just for Africa, for the world, so what is important for us here to understand is that Nikwenor, in doing that role, is actually going to take his great African spirit and use it to think about how the whole world 
needs to fit into a public responsibility framework in the ICANN agenda. And he will, uh, I'm sure, gather a great team, a diverse team of people from around the world, and he will take the leadership, which as you know him, I am certain he will. So we welcome him in this role, and we welcome ICANN having that discussion as a community on our public responsibilities moving forward. Me? Actually, maybe the best response is uh, give me some time <laughs> to understand what the community is uh, expecting. Uh, and so maybe the next I can meet him, if you ask me, I'll be able to be much more intelligent about uh, a response. But what I can say is that uh, uh, I feel honored by the confidence the community has in me and in particular the support uh, from Fadi and Steve and Pierre uh, for me to undertake this effort. And uh, I look forward to applying myself appropriately in addressing that issue with the panel and the community. Sorry, Remy again. Um, when uh, uh, Dr. Ni nee was responding to my earlier question, he made mention of uh, separating internet from other part of ICT, if I got it right, sir. And in doing that, I'm not sure whether you also realize that in, in bulk of developing countries, including Africa, that most ISPs are actually going underground and the telcos are more or less springing up to offer the same service that ISPs cannot withhold now. Uh, now that we have made that kind of suggestion, uh, which part can we take to reclaim that? Because that was the kind of model that was existing before the takers came in and then took over the market. If you take Nigeria, for instance, that was the scene. A lot of ISPs were existing, but when they came into the scene, it was a different ball game. The ISPs cannot sell their products. Now the, the takers are now selling the same product with their voice products. And if you are going to reclaim it, are we going to engage the government so intensely to ensure that there is enough incentive that are implementable? Thank you. If the telcos are providing internet service, they are ISPs. Uh, the only thing one is thinking about here is that let's not apply the telecommunication regulation approaches to how the internet things are working. If they are all become, they've all become ISPs, then we should manage them as ISPs. Uh, if they are providing other content services, then we should think of them as such. So it's not really to say they shouldn't be in ISP business, um, but there are other things. I mean, we have registrars, we have registries, we have content you know, developers, we have you know, provisioning, com you know, content provisioning companies, we have e-commerce companies, and I'm asking, where is Africa? What policy will spur movement into e-commerce or into heavy development of content or delivery of content or encourage registrars to emerge, even in the local CCTLD? I mean, there must be a different kind of policy that will encourage those things. And I, I'm asking that the country should take a good look and, in a way, think freely <laughs> as opposed to apply some other method of regulation to this new thing. That's really, you know, I have no prescription, but I think it would not work the old way. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Fadi, did you want to add something? Uh, there's one other uh, uh, point I want to add about Dr. Quainer, and, and Ni, you correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I believe you were the first African board member elected to the ICANN Board of Directors, correct? Is that, is that right? Yes, please. Uh, when was that? 2000. I think you're too old to do anything else for us now, Ni. I'm sorry. I'm more than <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions in the room? Please. Um, my follow-up is uh, a response to uh, feelers I got from uh, ordinary internet users who we have over, over the years tried to encourage to be part of the process in terms of multi-stakeholder that ICANN has been pushing. But one other thing they keep coming back with is that the process of engagement, initial engagement, is becoming difficult. Because our finding also 
shows that those who are already in terms of the constituencies that ICANN is using to run its multi recorder are like tightening the, the knot for newcomers to join them. They will tell you that it's uh, internet uh, users group or this and that, but membership or joining them to build new ideas is not happening. They will give you a lot of conditions why you cannot or why you must have a platform before you can join them. So it's making it more difficult for people, especially in our own environment, where people are still like looking at things individually. Okay, so now my question is, uh, I don't know whether you also envisage such challenges, but how is ICANN go going to handle that to make sure that the, the, the space is more open and things are done let, to the letter? This is uh, an excellent question and one that uh, has uh, quite a bit of sobering truth in it. Any organization as it grows naturally becomes more, dem more complex, more difficult, more bureaucratic, and ICANN has grown. But the outcome of that has become that engaging into the ICANN policy processes and development processes has become harder for a newcomer. Now, we realize that, and in the last six, seven months, we have obviously, as you heard, started a major global effort to go and draw people into the ICANN sphere. But that on its own does not solve the problem you just laid. That simply brings more people to be more frustrated. Therefore, in parallel with that, and these are things that you have not seen yet because they've been in development, we have started a major effort to also make it easier for people to engage into the ICANN sphere. Uh, this will include education. We will be announcing uh, soon some initiatives in that area that I think we've, you will be very pleased with that are designed to make it easier to understand how to participate and how to make contributions into ICANN. Second, we have started showing new technologies here in Durban that will be developed and deployed in the weeks ahead uh, under the banner of ICANN Labs that will allow digital engagement down to a mobile device for people to participate and to engage in dialogue with ICANners. Third, as I announced from the first day I started, ICANN must be changed from the inside out to not be a fortress, but to be an oasis. And I'm in Africa here as an African, so I think you understand what I mean by oasis. This is an open, welcoming place that has no walls, that does not discriminate, that is inclusive. The inclusivity and representativity of people here in Africa and around the world in the ICANN sphere is foundational to our legitimacy. If people find that they arrive to our gate and they're not included or they're not able to represent their interests, we lose our legitimacy. So we are fixing this, as I said, through education and through digital engagement, but we are also fixing it from the inside out by changing the DNA of ICANN. Well, how do you do that? Well, you heard me say in the last few weeks, first of all, we're taking our own operations and spreading them around the world. So we're not hiring anymore in Los Angeles. We're hiring people in our new hubs in Istanbul, in Singapore. We're trying to change the DNA of our own posture as an organization. We also are spending effort and time and money to uh, enable the rethinking of our structures and policy efforts. You heard me announce today a new ICANN strategy panel called multi-stakeholder innovation to rethink how we can make policy on a scalable level with more people involved. I will finish by echoing what you said, that indeed any system that has grown like this for years is a system that is prone to people uh, not wanting change, people maybe resisting change, people resisting newcomers and participation, 
That's normal. Any system does that. It is incumbent upon us as active members of this community to ensure that these ten, you know, trendings or these uh, natural uh, evolutions of a growing organization are broken. And you have my personal commitment through my actions that you will see that we are breaking these and we're ensuring everyone is welcome, included, and represented in the ICANN processes. Dr. Crocker, let me spin off on that. In, in your remarks this morning, you raised the point of as we grow larger, it's important to retain compassion. I'm paraphrasing you. These are not your exact words. Elaborate on that as a spinoff to what Fadi had just addressed, if you would, please. Yeah, thank you, Brad. That's exactly uh, where I wanted to go with this. Um, the, uh, the phrase that I used this morning was uh, empathy. Um, and I mean that not just in a vague uh, way, but in a uh, very specific way of learning uh, uh, about the needs and the uh, um, human aspects of the people that we're dealing with, with the organizations, with the countries that we're dealing with, uh, and uh, having all of our interactions, whether they are high-level philosophical actions, whether they are long-term policy development actions, or whether they're day-to-day -day, uh, ordinary transactions, if you will, uh, have everybody who's involved uh, be conscious of and attentive to um, the fact that this is a uh, an interaction with people that we are serving, that we view as partners and as uh, colleagues within the Internet ecosystem, that uh, these interactions and relationships are continuous and uh, long-lasting, and that uh, very often will involve people who will be in one position one day and a different position another day. They may be our employees, uh, past or future, uh, they may be board members, uh, they may be uh, 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 moving around throughout the community, and that uh, uh, what we want to do is make it a positive experience, even when the substance of the uh, interaction might be that we have to say no to something. Uh, it should be done in a way that is a positive and um, engaging experience that is uh, an improvement in the relationship overall. Um, we, uh, we're not a for-profit company, we're not trying to, uh, to go increase our revenues, uh, but the slogan that comes from the commercial world that every contact is an opportunity, uh, I think, is one that we should apply. And I don't mean it in a superficial way of uh, simply wishing everybody have a nice day, uh, you know, when they call up and yell at us or something like that. I, I mean, uh, really substantive relationship building. Um, and I think that that will go a long way in every dimension. I think it will improve the quality of our service. I think it will improve the quality of the knowledge that we have. I think it will um, facilitate uh, the uh, growth and uh, uh, maturity of the Internet ecosystem in, uh, throughout the region. Um, and, uh, and we will all feel better for it. And it's a positive experience and that will be uh, more satisfying than if we just think that we're doing a, uh, a civil service job from nine to five. Uh, Fadi, I, I received a, question, a number of questions from reporters that I had contact with after your welcoming ceremony today. We made a big deal about the RAA and the registry agreement. For the sake of reporters, and there are a lot of reporters that are covering us, they dip into our world, they don't cover us on a regular basis. Can you kind of explain in very lay speak why those two agreements are so important and why they move us closer to GTLDs? Every uh, accredited registrar in the world that is uh, licensed or accredited to provide domain names to potential registrants or current registrants uh, needs to be accredited by ICANN. And that contract is designed so as we accredit them, we ensure that they're capable of doing what they do. We ensure that if uh, they have an emergency situation and they can't serve the registrants, we, can, we have the mechanisms to step in and serve the registrants. 
it ensures that they maintain a clear set of principles in serving these registrants because uh, one of the new things we put in that uh, registrar accreditation agreement is a very clear document called the registrants rights and responsibilities written in plain English as opposed to the difficult kind of legal English most of us can't understand so we have through this agreement enabled a global instant with one agreement, a global uh, regime to accredit and manage the performance of these partners and ensure that we and them are aligned, that our target service is towards the registrant and the end user. I mean, and, and I'm going to be uh, a little bit blunt here. The registrar is not an ICANN customer. The registrar is with us a partner to serve our real target end user, and that's the user, the registrant, that uses the DNS today. So this is the significance of this one agreement that allows us with one uh, uh, issue of that agreement to get a global common baseline for uh, serving the DNS users. The registry agreement is different. These are the entities that are being licensed by ICANN in order to operate their top-level domain. Now, I use the word licensed by ICANN because that's the nature of the relationship. Again, to be quite direct, the registry is not a customer of ICANN. The registry is a partner of ICANN in the delivery of services through the registrars that ultimately are for the benefit of the end user and the registrar. By setting this clear and by building agreements in that spirit, which we haven't done by imposing them, we have done it the multi-stakeholder way. By sitting down with the stakeholders and developing these contracts with the public interest at heart, and that's what we did. Very few contracts on the planet are built this way, but at ICANN, even the contract is built from the bottom up with the community and then shared for public comment, uh, enhanced and amended for public comment, and then delivered as the tool by which we manage our licensees as well as our accredited registrars around the globe. And today, we have delivered the most robust, the most complete set of agreements in the history of ICANN and we had the initial signatories today here. It's a historical moment for us, for the industry uh, in Durban today. So we're very, obviously, very, very pleased with that development. Sir. Hi, uh, David from htxt.africa. As you can tell, our website is kind of primed for the new GTLDs to land. Um, basically, what I'd like to know is there's um, there's very limited resources, specifically in South Africa, when you look at something like electricity. And um, what's happening now is we've got smart grids and smart cities and the Internet of Things starting to roll out to Africa where we need to look at how to take our limited resources and uh, apply them better so that um, what we have at the moment can be used for our growing population. As you said, we're the fastest growing continent on, in, in the world. So um, with that in mind, how is ICANN dealing with uh, governments and municipalities and things like that in terms of uh, something like an IPv6 rollout where ensuring that the entire continent is ready for something like the Internet of Things and a smart grid and what have you and uh, is something like ICANN Labs being a part of that in terms of helping to roll out technology where um, certain countries may not be aware of the ability to take what they have and make it better and focus it. I will tell you the small bit I do on this. The small bit I do on this is when I meet American or European or companies in the developed world, I tell them that a lot of innovation is happening in Africa. I don't tell them to come to Africa because Africa needs, frankly, their training or their help. We talk about the great things happening in Africa now. Africa leads the world in mobile innovation right now. And we need to keep telling people who are looking for business opportunities and looking for growth that Africa is a place where they can come and actually uh, grow their portfolios and their 
activities. So uh, Africa is ready and primed for that level of innovation. Uh, and I think the world should come and learn from Africa and participate in Africa's innovation drive right now. But in terms of specifically what we're doing uh, to work with the government and others to enable the infrastructure that will make things like the Internet of Things happen, I will uh, look to my friend Pierre to, uh, for some guidance and insights. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this question, which also calls for the, what you might call the need for um, Africa to really own this technology. Uh, you mentioned issues such as you know, resources, such as power, and all of those things. And all of this goes really together, actually. And if you want to have a robust, you know, ICT industry, definitely you need to think about those. Uh, and uh, uh, energy, um, I was discussing with uh, um, uh, Dr. Elam, the commissioner, you know, of Africa Union, and then uh, she was telling me that uh, they are actually developing this, you know, strategy. Uh, in Africa and energy is coming high, you know, on, on, on the thing, delivery, which means that uh, it's very important. But you are right, you know, what are we doing with government? Um, I tend to say that ICANN's role is, uh, well, a tiny role when it comes to this thing, because it's all about government, you know, having the right strategy and they put the right strategy, you know, in place uh, if they really want to harness, you know, this ICT. Um, what we humbly you know, can do and what we are trying to do, for instance, now is to um, reach out to government, for instance, uh, but in our own sort of arena, which is uh, domain management and all of those things. Country where we are having government, we just come forward and say, okay, I, now I want to, I want a redelegation, you know, of my uh, CCTLD. And um, we have close to 10 countries today where we are experiencing this thing, where government suddenly say, well, I want to manage this thing. Um, but then we have to educate, to uh, tell people that, okay, there are procedures, and uh, also uh, you might own, you might think that you own your CCTLD, but you are a custodian, that, uh, I mean, it has to resolve, it has to be done properly, it has to be done according to sort of global international laws, you know, or regulation. For instance, so we have to educate at, at some point. We also have to expose them to best practices for us in that regard. Um, I can also, and uh, on, uh, on um, I think on Wednesday, for instance, we have a, a panel or what I call a session, what we are calling Digital Africa. So this is the first time we are bringing, you know, to ICANN uh, new young, I mean, young entrepreneurs that are actually trying to do whatever they can in terms of, you know, innovation. innovation. And uh, they are going to showcase what they've been doing. And uh, one of them told me, for instance, that, well, um, if our government could really understand what we are doing, if our government, because they say, well, we are young, we really want to, to, to do something, we are much more interested, no, we don't have jobs, so but our government are still working on the whole old model, for instance, so they are really in need of you know, new models. So some of the things we do is, okay, outreach to uh, the countries, and then some of the things I'm going to do within the Africa strategy is definitely that one, how we do engage with government you know, and talk about digital economy. That's what we want to talk about, that they really see that these, there are potential there. And that call for, okay, building your own strategy for okay, broadband, but of course also for energy, you know, um, I think the good news is that uh, this INGA from, I mean that in, from Africa, from DRC, is going to be revamped and then also built in the African Development Bank. All of those are quite interested in that, I mean, in terms of energy, because the belief is that this INGA is going to at least to solve African problem, and uh, DRC, its, its own, could be covering half of Africa in terms of energy. So this is a potential there, here. And it seems that Africa you know, has yeah. now understood this thing and uh, there's going to be some sort of uh, Marshall plan you know, on this thing. So yeah. I think this is promising, anyway. but you are right, there are issues actually. My name is Alfred Ngobana uh, from the South News 24 in South Africa. Uh, how to deal with the, the robots in Africa? Thank you. You, you, Thank you are expressing a concern on uh, cyber security and some of the tools that are being used that are uh, making it uh, a not so safe place to do certain things. Um, so you're discussing security of the internet and so on. Uh, I'm sure uh, 
my good friend here will have a lot to say, but I can tell you that on the continent, we have a group of institutions that we call AFSTARS, that's the African Internet Groups, and one of them is uh, focusing on creating what they refer to as emergency response teams. We call the group Africa Set. And the idea is to support governments and other institutions in countries to build their own response teams around their networks. So that if you have a bank or a system of banks, uh, they need to have a way of responding when there's uh, an intrusion. So we want to help at least on the uh, that side of the mediation. Now, we also um, uh, believe that uh, capacity is a major aspect of this problem, both from the user end as well as the service end. And so we do have programs within the AFNOG environment to train operatives how to deal with these things. Mm -hmm. um, we also have programs that help governments in bilateral way to also understand better how to manage these things. So there's a whole host of things that uh, you know, we want to engage countries and, and institutions and governments around how to respond to these things. And I'm sure eventually we'll get to a point of uh, being able to uh, you know, prevent them uh, with some of the new techniques coming, such as the DNSSEC and uh, you know, RPKI, things leading to routing and so on and so forth. I think this is enough for a start. Gentlemen, thank you again.